This is the Citizen of Heaven podcast, the year in review. I am Hal Hammonds and I am a citizen of heaven and I am your embedded correspondent in Satan's world. I bring you this message of hope today from Pensacola, Florida. This is report number 52, dated March 31st in the year of our Lord 2020. I bid God's grace and peace to my all my fellow sojourners here in this earthly plane. I remain sound in body, alert in mind, and energized in spirit. In this week's podcast, we will look at what I have learned about my work in the last 12 months. I've been preaching to the camera for the last couple of weeks. I really thought it was going to be easy. Actually, for me at least, it's much, much harder. I'll explain why and what I'm doing about it. I've been reading a lot less news. Once I thought the news connected me to what was really going on in the world. These days, I really believe the exact opposite is true. I've been hearing about social distancing, both the voluntary and the involuntary versions. I'm tired of complaining about it. Now I'm looking for a way to make it work in our favor. I've been playing Sheriff of Nottingham. Our family got into board gaming to make our entertainment more interactive, and this game is all about interaction. Are you ready? Here we go. This is what I've been preaching. Yeah, after 52 weeks of podcasting experience, I really thought that preaching to the camera would not be that big of a deal. I've been forced to do this for the last couple of weeks because of the, the current coronavirus business, and we all know about that. I thought that this would be a relatively seamless transition because I'm used to preaching and I'm used to cameras, and so what's the problem? Well, it turns out there's a lot of problems. It's a much, much more of a hassle than I realized, The getting everything in the frame and, and focusing and visual aids. and it's, it's much more complicated than the audio or the video portion of the podcast has been. But we're, we're getting by. I'm not whining about it. We're certainly hoping that things are going to change before too long. But if they don't, I am content with, to go with the flow, to, to find my contentment, because that's what God tells us to do, regardless of circumstances. And there have been preachers of the gospel. There are preachers today who have much, much worse circumstances than I do. It's not appropriate for me to complain. So instead, what I'm going to do is try to find a, a positive, trying to find a lesson in all this. In fact, I'm going to share three of them with you very briefly here today. The first one is that I need to make the best of bad circumstances, uh, circumstances not of my choosing, circumstances that I would like to change. And maybe I can, but if I can't, if I can't change things, then I, mean, then I need to be in, in a better state of mind. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 12 and following, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my uh, imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And that most of my brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. What a tremendous silver lining to this. Paul says, I am getting an opportunity to preach to people that I would never have preached to before. Roman soldiers were not typically in Paul's audience in, uh, in Philippi or anywhere else in Rome. He's probably imprisoned in Rome at this particular time. And now every soldier in the Praetorian Guard has been shackled to Paul's arm for six hours at a time. What's he going to do for six hours? He's going to preach the gospel to him. Well, why wouldn't he? And they're not going anywhere. They're a captive audience in the most literal of senses. Is it yielding results? I don't know. Um, Paul doesn't say anything about that, but what difference does it make? He is still preaching the gospel. He is still busy about the work, and other people are seeing his courage, and they are being emboldened as well. So the bad circumstances are turning out for a good thing, and I have every confidence that our current situation is no different, that we can find a way to make lemonade out of these lemons that the Lord is blessing us with at this particular time. It may not be what you would like to have, but it can be something that glorifies God if we choose to make it so. Similarly, the second point is that we need to find contentment. We need to not be complainers. We need to not be satisfied with what we do not have, as it were. If I could just get to this particular place, if I could get, just get rid of this enemy, if I could just get my family healthy, if I could just uh, restore financial security to the local church or whatever it happens to be. Paul says in Philippians 4 verse 11 that he's found the secret to being content in whatever state he's in. And what a wonderful example that is for us. We don't wait around for the world to change to suit our liking. We find our contentment now. I am at peace with myself. I'm at peace with the world. I'm at peace with God, with my brethren. 
And, and I refuse to allow it to be any other way. Why would I want to be? Why wouldn't I want to be content with such situations? And similarly, the third point is to maintain my enthusiasm. I like to think of myself as a rel- relatively positive person. I like to think that I am uh, putting on a happy face uh, most of the time. And it's not a fake thing. I, I am genuinely happy with my life. I'm blessed in my life. I'm blessed in family. I'm blessed in the Lord. I'm blessed socially with friends and loved ones and family. It's a wonderful life that I'm living. And I refuse to pretend like it's anything else. Yes, there are bad things going on to me personally. There are bad things that are going on to my family, to our world, to uh, our particular culture, to the local church perhaps. There are all kinds of bad news items out there if we want to look for them. But my enthusiasm, my positivity is going to rub off on my family. It's going to rub off on the people that listen to my podcast or that that hear me preach or, or whatever. It just has to. Uh, maybe by being positive, Paul, as Paul was in Philippi, remember, in jail, in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, singing psalms with his, his brother Silas in the middle of the night and other people hearing them. That positivity had to have rubbed off, rubbed off on them. I suspect it probably rubbed off on the Philippian jailer who wound up being baptized that very night. There are situations where we can turn this to a positive. And that, that's my big takeaway in all of this. I am trying to allow these sermons that I'm preaching to apply to my life, but not specifically to my life, uh, not be tied down with circumstances. The temptation is always to, to be timely, to be relevant, to be current, as it were. And, and I'm trying to break away from that a little bit. Uh, I'm not suggesting that I don't want to be timely because obviously I do. But the gospel is not timely. The gospel is timeless. The gospel relates to us here, but not because we are putting in a particular framework, because it is given to human beings because it was once for all delivered to the saints. So I want to be preaching a gospel that is timely, yes, but not bound by time. Not I don't want to spend the next six months preaching about coronavirus. I want to be preaching about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if it helps people through a particular situation in their life, if it helps them through a particular struggle that they're facing, then that's just that much better. Anyway, that's what I've been preaching. This is what I've been reading. Most of you are probably aware that the word news, N-E-W-S, is completely made up. Which you may find ironic, depending on your perspective these days. But that's another story. Uh, some enterprising journalist in the early days of, of news gathering, as it came to be known, uh, decided that N standing for North and E standing for East and W standing for West and S standing for South could make up a word and therefore news would be what's going on all over the place. And so we have news and we have newspapers. It could just as easily be snoo or wens or, or something like that. We could be lining our bird cages with snoo papers instead of newspapers today. But such as it is, we have news and I say all that to say that the word news, as far as I can tell anyway, doesn't really have any inherent connection with the word new. And that is appropriate because, as Solomon tells us from the beginning, there is nothing new under the sun. There may have been an event that happened yesterday that hadn't happened before to a person to whom it had not happened before or whatever. But but there's nothing really new in the world. And so tracking the news can get to be a very tiresome sort of thing if you're inclined to look at it that way. And such has been the case in my life anyway for the last few years. When I decided I was going to report in this podcast about what I've been reading, uh, that was not an attempt from me to get back into keeping up with current events, as it were. Uh, That was... I understood there was going to be more broad kind of thing, what I've been reading in terms of fiction, in terms of history, biographies, things of that nature. And that's how I want to continue doing this. In fact, the only book really that I reported on, as I can remember, last year, that was of a, uh, of a current event sort of thing was Frank Luntz's book about how, what Americans are really thinking really. And that current events book was written in 2008, so not very current there, of course. 
And this is a trend that I want to continue in season two. I don't want to get locked into reporting the news. I spent a fair amount of my time as a preacher over the years looking at current events, current news, current happenings, current personalities, and using that to make some kind of spiritual point. And I still do that some. But I don't do it as much as I used to. And I certainly don't think that it is serving the same kind of purpose that I thought it was serving back then. Uh, I thought that it was keeping me relevant, keeping me hip or whatever, making drawing a little bit of attention or whatever, which it may or may not do. I don't know. But I am breaking more and more away from the idea that the news is what it's all about. That reporting on what's going on in the world is is important. And we touched on that, I think, a little bit in the, uh, in the previous segment. The real world that we talk about, that we oftentimes are told to find in newspapers and news websites and such, is not nearly as real as we would be led to believe. And that's not a comment on so-called fake news. That's just saying that real is a matter of perspective. If you live in the world and consider yourself a citizen of the world, if this is all you know, then yes, I suppose this is your reality. But for the Christian, our reality is heaven. If real is determined by whether it actually exists, how long it exists, how relevant it is, how much of an impact it has on your life, then things of this life do not hold a candle to the things of heaven. It's not even remotely close. That's the reality. That's the real world, if you will. The problem that we need to be dealing with is the sin problem. The enemy that we need to be dealing with is the devil, the one who crawls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour in 1 Peter 5, verse 8. The challenge that we have in this life is the challenge of holiness, the challenge to draw closer to God in an era when more and more people seem to be pulling further and further away from God. I'll refer you again to the book of Philippians, Philippians 2 and verse 14 and following. Do all things without grumbling or disputing or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, going through verse number 16 there a little bit. What we do as Christians is not timely. It's not locked into a time frame. It's not changing and morphing and developing over over history, or my personal history, or, or the history of the world as far as that goes. We are Christians. We are citizens of heaven, and our objective is always heavenly. Our objective is always to, to achieve things for God, to strive toward heavenly things, to eventually reach heaven itself. That's what we're all about. And the things that we read will oftentimes distract us from that. I, I really cringe when I see Christians getting caught up and and overwrought, really, losing sleep over current events, over things that are happening in the world. And my advice oftentimes is just to put it down, to quit reading the news, which is a perspective that I never would have imagined presenting 20 years ago. I thought people who avoided the news were shallow and and maybe a little bit ignorant, willfully ignorant. And I have very little patience for willful ignorance in my life. And, and I'm still not suggesting that, that everybody ought to just turn their TV sets off, turn their computers off, and never return to the political spectrum again, never return to the front page again. That's not my point at all. But we don't live there. We don't obsess there. There are other things to know. There are other things to learn. And I remain firmly convinced that I can read a history book or a biography or some other kind of commentary on the human condition that is not necessarily written in the last 12 months or the last 12 years even. Something that is in intelligent though, something that is well thought out, that is well researched, that is thoughtful, that will give me a better insight into what's going on with human beings than is something that is absolutely current or relevant as we may say. Because whether it was written today or yesterday is not nearly as important as some people think that it was, that it is. What's important is, of course, whether it's true, whether it connects to our existence as human beings. And there's nothing more true than the Bible. So whatever we are reading, whatever I am reading, let's make sure we read the Bible first. Let's start with that. Don't let our concerns for physical things overwhelm our commitment towards spiritual things. So that, 
in season two, we're going to see more of the same as far as this goes. There will probably be some references to current articles or current books or whatever, but I'm going to continue to try to dwell in greater truths than that, not being moved by the, the whims of, of current circumstances, but rather focused on who we are as human beings, where we are going as Christians, and how God's going to get us from one place to the other. Anyway, that's what I've been reading. This is what I've been hearing. You know, as soon as social distancing became a thing, as soon as people started talking about the need to stay indoors and not associate with other people and not breathe on other people, etc., all of these memes started coming out on social media from the introverts. All right, I've been training for this my whole life. I'm living in a dream world. It's just me and my books, me and my pets, me and my whatever. Uh, I don't have to associate with anybody else. What a wonderful world. I love coronavirus. I'm, you know, I'm exaggerating somewhat here. But I, I do, th and I'm a big fan of taking jokes for what they are. All right, I, I realize I have a very healthy sense of humor. I, I appreciate a good joke as much as anybody else. But I do want to say this, and I'm going to make a statement here, and then I'm going to put it in some context here, so don't get too far ahead of me. There is a sense in which introversion can become indulgence. There is a sense in which our delight in isolation is basically an excuse for not loving our neighbor as ourselves. Now, having said that, let me back up and put a little context in here before I start getting stones thrown at the, the, at the speakers or the, or the television set here. I love introverts. I have very strong introverted tendencies myself. I'm married an introvert. My, my children are introverts. Kylie is probably the biggest extrovert in the family, and she loves holding up in her bedroom as much as the next person. I'm not suggesting here that every introvert is unloving any more than I'm suggesting that every extrovert is a show-off or an egotist. I am saying this, that we have a tendency to turn our personality traits on whatever end of the spectrum they are toward our purposes and bring out the worst in ourselves rather than do what God has told us to do, which is to bring out the best in ourselves as he gets to define best. And so that's what I want to do for a little bit, talking about how we spend our time here. And I realize I've spent most of the podcast here talking about how we're not going to be current and we're not going to talk about, you know, the news and such. And here we are talking about coronavirus again. But bear with me on this because I have bigger applications than, than just coronavirus here. Because I believe that this is the world that we're living in and we're likely to stay here for a while. This idea that I have my smartphone or I have my Netflix or I have my, my little bitty world here. And if I want to play games on my console with somebody on the other side of the world, I can do that. And that's my idea of, of socializing. I, I don't want to actually deal with any human beings. So I'm going to order my toilet paper on, on Amazon. Uh, my, you know, the Walmart.com is going to send me all my groceries. I, I don't want to touch any human being if I can possibly avoid it. That is more and more the world that we're living in here. And that has a very profound negative side to it. What we need to do in this time of isolation, as for better or for worse, whether we like it or not, we are cooped up to ourselves to a large degree. Are we using this isolation as an opportunity to glorify God, or are we using it as an opportunity to indulge ourselves? And that is what we do with every impulse, with every circumstance that comes across us. Is this being used for our glory or for God's glory, for God's purposes or for my purposes? And I'm going to suggest to you here that there is very definitely a way for you to pursue God's purposes through your introversion, to pursue God's purposes through social isolation. And it's just a matter of doing it. It's just a matter of finding the way to turn lemons into lemonade. Basically, there is, in this era of social isolation, there are the people that we are forced to be with and there are the people who were forced to stay away from. And there's two groups of people, one very, very small group of people, and then the broader population. What are our dealings with those people? I'm going to offer you a suggestion for both of these. They're just going to allow you to glorify God in your social, dis dis in your social distancing. Pardon my mumbling here. 
I am cooped up, not currently, of course, I, the office is empty, so I'm able to come into the office, but uh, I'm generally speaking on most hours of most days cooped up with my family. I got two daughters and, and my wife and, and our dog. Is there a way for me to draw closer to my family? Is there a way for me to maximize my family time? And the answer needs to be yes. If I am, in fact, going to spend more quality time than normal with my family, I need to make it quality time. There is an opportunity for me to study the Bible with my family. There's an opportunity for me to connect socially with my family, to catch up on, on what's going on in their life, what they're feeling, what they're hoping, what they're hating, to grow closer in our relationship with one another. However big an introvert you are, we all have social needs in this world. And there's no more important social need than that need of family. And if we can use the time that we have in isolation to build these bonds, then these times are not going to be wasted on us, especially when we turn ourselves towards spiritual purposes. Joshua 24, verse 15, uh, we all know at least part of that verse where Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How is it that Joshua is able to speak definitively with regard to his family as he is on death's door? Because he has connected with his family on a spiritual level. I don't know if he had what they would call the ancient equivalent of home Bible studies or, or how exactly it worked. But when we have opportunity to build a common faith in a family, why would we not do that? Any person, let alone any family, under the current circumstances that is not reading their Bible more often than they were before, ought to be ashamed of themselves. This is a golden opportunity to grow our faith and especially to grow our faith in the family unit. And beyond that, the ones that we're forced to avoid in this situation. If we cannot socialize like we want to, if we cannot play sports, if we cannot uh, go to restaurants or whatever, whatever kind of dating or other circumstance where you are used to associating with other people, what are we going to fill that time with? If we are forced to avoid those other things, those things that are not spiritual nature, not necessarily bad things, but carnal things, are we replacing those things with good things? Are we finding a way to focus ourselves more completely on spiritual things, focus ourselves more completely on God? Let's all be honest about this. We live in a very busy world where all kinds of things are going on. Busyness, if you will, is strangling the Lord's church. And all of a sudden now, from out of the blue, this horrible, horrible thing has come to us. And now, through forces beyond our reckoning, we are not able to indulge in all these weeds in our life. We're not capable of going to our kids' soccer practice. We're not capable of practicing with our band or whatever it happens to be. It's just not an option anymore. Can we find a way to turn that extra time, that extra energy toward God? Or are we going to wind up basically just planting more weeds? That's the, the amazing thing about Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, where these, these people are described as being the weedy or the thorny soil. They're, they're just so cluttered up with stuff. They can't bring fruit to the Lord. Now God has gotten rid of all of our weeds. And what are we going to do? Well, I got to I got to go subscribe to, to Disney's streaming service and I've got to get some kind of online gaming club or I've got to do some kind of something or other. Maybe I'll binge watch Mad Men or get cut up on Game of Thrones or whatever it happens to be. I, I got to fill this hour with something. In our mad dash to fill our time with something, fill our energy, fill our attention with something, we not only avoid spiritual things, but we find more carnal things, things that may be even more carnal than they were before. Don't plant weeds in your life. Thank God for having the weeds taken out of our life and then use that extra time, that extra energy to invest in your spirit. Anyway, that's what I've been hearing. If you want to stop listening at this point and go your way, I hope you've found the message instructive, inspiring, and most of all, faithful to God's Word. Please don't forget to like, rate, share, subscribe, and follow. But if you stick around for a few more minutes, I would like to share with you a way to amuse yourself in a wholesome manner while waiting here in Satan's world, and perhaps pick up a spiritual point or two in the process. This is what I've been playing. As with virtually every major behavior modification in my family, our current love of board games began as a way to try to save money. Hal Hammonds, famous tightwad, nice to meet you. We were spending an enormous amount of money to pump 
the world's entertainment into our television sets, most of which was not worth watching, most of which we did not watch, in fact. And it occurred to us, maybe we could, instead of spending $100 on television every month, we could spend $100 every two or three months on board games. And we probably did save a little bit of money. And uh, maybe just because we didn't have as much access to gross entertainment, we didn't watch as much gross entertainment. But the most profound difference was not on that level at all. The most profound difference was social. That Tracy and I were able to spend more, much more quality time together and to a somewhat lesser extent, but still a very large extent, we were able to extend that fellowship to the girls as well. Let's be honest. You know, Watching television, watching a movie is not a social event. Not really. If somebody tries to talk too much during the TV show, you get mad at them. It's kind of the opposite of being social. Board games allowed us to be in the same place at the same time and genuinely enjoy one another's company. And there's no game that is more in that wheelhouse for our family anyway than Sheriff of Nottingham. This was one of the very first games that we took to, and we took to it right away. It's a, it's a delightful game. The girls just absolutely love this. The idea basically is that you are peasants in Nottingham Forest and the sheriff is going to stop you every once in a while because he thinks that you're running contraband to Robin Hood and his band of merry men and you protest and say no I'm just a mere bread baker I, I make cheese I, I farm chickens or whatever it happens to be this is all that it is and if you're able to get your goods to market you get a certain amount of money and if you are the best in this particular market you get a bonus but if you are able to successfully smuggle some contraband through underneath the sheriff's nose, then you get a big bonus uh, after that. Now, the sheriff has the right to confiscate your goods and check. If you're carrying legal goods, then he's going to have to pay you a premium. If he catches you carrying contraband, then he's going to confiscate all your contraband and he's going to fine you for doing this. And so that's basically how the game works, at least it's how it's supposed to work. In reality, I'm not sure exactly that you're transported into the land of Robin Hood or anything like that. But it is a lot of fun, and it is an opportunity for you to to bluff and to, which is not to say lie. We were opposed to lying. We covered this in the, the resistance episode before. But you have an opportunity to to read your opponent and, and maybe make a little deal with the sheriff under the table or something like that to try to find a way to, to maximize your profit and eventually have the most money at the end of the game and be declared the winner and the, the greatest merchant in all of Nottingham Forest. That's the game, essentially, and I, I commend it to you. Check it out. But the bigger question that I would like to focus on is this idea of socialization, this idea of prioritizing in your family, in your group, getting together with people and enjoying yourself and, and spending quality time together in interaction and socialization. This is a good thing, and we talked about introverts a little bit in the previous segment. I'm not suggesting that introverts have to become extroverts. But there is a social need that we all have. And you may pursue it through board gaming or through book club or whatever it happens to be. But you need to pursue it. You need to find fellowship in this life with people who are like-minded. And certainly that is absolutely the case and even more the case with regard to Christians. Christians need other Christians. We need to be socialized. We need to be connected with others. You may not feel it as much as the other person. You may not cry when you don't get it like somebody else might or whatever, but there is a very real need that we all have to connect with brothers and sisters in Christ. I can't believe I have to fight this fight with people, but I do. I have to fight it with parents. We had an episode a while back where a we had a, a social gathering and spiritual gathering, also Bible study and food and, and fun, and uh, all the young people were coming, and this this the parent of one of the young people said, because her daughter wasn't coming and and we asked her about that and she kind of smiled and said we don't force our children to socialize we don't believe in forced socialization is how she put it and i just kind of nodded about okay whatever but what i'm thinking in the back of my head is well i guess you're not a very good parent are you the idea of not forcing your your children to socialize and especially in a christian environment not forcing your children to socialize with brothers and sisters in christ robbing them of an opportunity to connect on a spiritual level with their peers? How can we do that? How can we possibly rationalize that? This is part of a much bigger societal problem that we're having that is absolutely infecting the church. We have a society where we have convinced an entire generation that they do not have to do what they do not want to do. 
at all. And that bears fruit with regard to whether they want to do the homework, whether they show up to work on time, or whether they want to keep their baby. If you don't feel like doing it, then you don't have to do it. You are the master of your universe. Well, you are not, whether you're 12 or 18 or 25 or 99. It doesn't make any difference. We all have obligations to forces greater than ourselves. And such is the case with your time and with your very body itself. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. We are the temple of the Spirit, the text says. You are not your own, for you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify the Lord in your body. You have an obligation to use what God has given you, including and particularly the body that you have, the time that he's given you to live in the body, to serve his purposes. And that includes particularly loving your neighbor as yourself. In 1 John chapter 4, John talks about this and the emphasis that we need to be placing on brotherly love. And again, we can make all kinds of excuses for ourselves, but this is what the Bible says on the subject. They, that is false teachers in verse five, are from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world and the world listens to them. We, that is the apostles, we are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who does not, who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. This is the context in which he says what he says in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God and everything. everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. This is what the apostles teach. This is the truth of God's word. You have an obligation to love your neighbor. And if your love is not showing, if your love is not seen by your neighbor, if you, in fact, are taking deliberate measures to keep from associating with your neighbor, you're trying to avoid showing love to your neighbor, then how can you possibly pass yourself off as someone who loves God? Take responsibility for your time. Take responsibility for your association with brothers and sisters in Christ. Delight in fellowship. That should not have to be learned behavior. But if it is learned behavior, then by all means, let's learn it before it's too late. Anyway, that's what I've been playing. This brings to a close season one of the Citizen of Heaven podcast. Thank you very much for your support, your encouragement, your prayers, and your help in sharing the message. Season two begins next week, God willing, and is likely to bring some changes. A tightened introduction, more guests, and perhaps better visuals as well. The biggest change will be in my studio itself. My family and I are relocating to Georgetown, Texas this summer, Lord willing. Hopefully my new surroundings will allow for better audio, but we will be glad to do our best with what the Lord provides. I'm also planning some additional video content outside the podcast. Keep in touch with me through Facebook and YouTube for updates. Until next time, be strong and courageous, fight the good fight of faith, and do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is Hal Hammonds, the Citizen of Heaven, signing off.